All right, the part of the passage that I want to focus in on this morning in Luke chapter 14 is a story starting in verse number 15. We're going to reread that now real quick. The Bible reads, and, one of, and when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, uh, of course, it is a very blessed thing. And, and what this man said here is true. But Jesus is going to go and explain a little bit further. He's talking about the kingdom of God. He say, blessed is that man that's going to eat with you in the kingdom of God. Amen. Blessed is he that's saved and is going to be in the kingdom of God and be able to eat with Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God. Jesus explains the, a, a truth to him here in verse number 16. The Bible says, Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many. So he's going to relate the kingdom of God now to this parable, to this story. And he's saying, you know what? There's a man. He made a great feast. He made a great supper. And he invited a lot of people. Right? He wanted a lot of people to come in and enjoy this feast with him. Verse number 17, And sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. So he sends out a servant. Okay, let everybody know it's time. Everything's ready to go. The food's ready. You know, the table's prepared. Come on in. We're going to have our feast. And here's what happens. A lot of people then make excuses as to why that, you know, they're invited to this great feast, but then they're going to say, oh, no, I can't go, right? Verse number 18, and they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. So, of course, the Lord of the house, he, he puts on this great feast. He lets everyone know, hey, I'm going to have this great supper. You're invited. You're invited. You're, I want you to be there. I want you to be there. He's going through a lot of work. He's going through a lot of effort. He's allowing them to come in. He's setting this great feast before them. You know, he loves these people, calling them to come in. Come into my house. I've got this feast for you. And, and they're all, you know, ready to go. And then it's, when it's time, they're like, well, no, actually, I got something else to do. And you look at these excuses, right? Well, I bought some land. I got to go check it out. It's like, I went through all that work for you and you're just going to go look at some land. You're going to go, you know, and all these various excuses that people give. That's why the guy's angry, right? The, the master of the house is angry because he's saying, why are you giving me this excuse? I've got this great thing prepared for you. I've invested in it, spent my time, spent my energy, and you're just going to blow it off like it's nothing. So he gets angry and says, well, you know what? We're going to have this feast anyways. Go out quickly into the streets, lanes of the city, bring in the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind. Verse 22, And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Now, obviously, he's teaching something more than just what he's explaining in this story. So this guy makes a feast. People don't show up that were, that were called, that were the ones that were invited originally to come to the feast. So the, the master gets angry and just says, well, we're going we're gonna to fill this house anyways. We're going to have this feast. So just invite basically anyone you can. Compel people to come in. I want my house to be filled. And he says, and he closes by saying, none of those men which are bidden shall taste of my supper. Now, I'm not going to get into all of the applications of this because there's a lot. Primarily, I think he's, he, what he's referring to is the Jews, right? Jesus came unto his own, his own received him not. So he had the chosen people, you know, they were, they were the ones that were called. They're the ones that, that, that God is, has, you know, separated unto himself. And basically, they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. So they're going to be rejected. And he says, well, they're not going to be called. So he's saying, you know, what? we're going to go out and, and basically get a new chosen people. And that's what they do. And he's just bringing in everybody. But um, so this primarily, I would say, has to do with the nation of Israel versus going out and into the, you know, the Gentile nations. 
as well as just salvation in general, right? Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Amen. All you have to do to eat bread in the kingdom of God is be saved. But the application I'm going to make of this, and I think it's also a fair application because one of the things that we see here is the mindset of, of the Lord, of God. Because that's who the master of the house is, is um, representing here, is, is God. God wants his, his house to be filled. Now, obviously, we know that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Bible says that, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God wants everybody to be saved. God wants everybody to go to heaven. That's why Jesus Christ paid for the sins of every single person to give that opportunity so that they could be saved. That's how much God wants Every, he paid the full price for everybody and then leaves the choice up to you. And as people hear, no, I don't want to go. Everyone is making an excuse as to why you don't want to receive, you know, this free gift or this free ticket to go to go have a great feast. Now, the reason why I'm going in depth into this is because we're going to be starting a new month and we've been doing challenges each month. So, in January, we did a Bible reading uh, challenge. We did a prayer challenge, baptism challenge. We're doing different things that we're focusing on just in your life, in your spiritual life, in your walk with God, different things that, that we ought to be doing and thinking about. And we're focusing on different areas each month. And the area that I want to focus in on in the month of um, May, where are, what month are we in already? We're in April. Almost over April, going into the month of May, is trying to get people to come to church. Amen. Now, obviously, it's not just about church. So, first and foremost, and, and our primary job is always will be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, getting people saved. And that is always the primary, no matter what our challenge is, no matter what, you know, anything else that we do, that will never cease from being at the top of the list. That is the top of the list. That's what our job is. That's what the goal is. We're going to be doing other things, though, along the way. And the goal is going to be to, and the reason why I'm doing, you know, I have, I have a lot of different challenges for the year already kind of planned out. But since we've already been trying to add to our soul winning and gospel presentations, getting people to be baptized because that's very important that someone, you know, starts off basically on the right foot, being obedient to God, getting baptized and just showing that, uh, that they're dying to their old self and, and all these other things. And I'm not going to preach all on baptism. I've done that already. It's a, it's a very important first step in a Christian's life. Getting plugged into church is also very important. It's extremely important. I don't know if any of you saw the interview I just did this week with Ben the Baptist on YouTube. We did a Google Hangout thing. Um, and basically, he was just interviewing me, asking me a bunch of questions about my life and, you know, trying to figure out and, and, and ask, you know, how did you get to where you are now, essentially? You know, when did you get saved? What's your salvation testimony? You know, and, and all along the way, like, how, how did you decide to become a pastor and things like that? And, and I never... Well, not never, because obviously I am a pastor now, but for the longest time, it wasn't my objective. It wasn't like I had this lifelong dream as a kid. I want to pastor a church one day. It wasn't like that at all. And one of the questions that he was asking me was, well, what flipped? What changed? Because even after I got saved, I was still living real worldly. I was still doing a lot of things I should have been doing. And I wasn't really going to church. I wasn't doing much with my life at all. So what is it that, that made this change? Well, you know what it was. Ultimately, what it was was getting in the right church, getting in a good church. Amen. It wasn't until I finally went to a good church where I could hear the Word of God just being preached and just being expounded on and, and receiving the conviction from, from God's Word, being edified, being among other people who believe the Bible like I do. Yeah. And encouraging and, and helping you to get, you know, that's what I needed. Right, right. And I really needed that. I was safe for a long time. I'd read the Bible a little bit here and there on my own. But you know what? There was no real change going on. I wasn't really moving in the right direction. 
because I needed to get plugged in. I needed to get planted in the house of God. That's where I needed to be in order for me to receive any further growth. And I think everybody needs that. Yeah, and we're going to go into some reasons why church is really important. You know, we're going to, I've already preached on that in the past, but I'm going to touch on some of the things again. But um, turn real quick to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. Because I just want to show you why I think this still is applicable in Luke 14, where we started off reading. Now, we also believe here, I believe that God ultimately is the one who builds the church. There's scripture to support that, that God's the one who's going to build the church. We need to just be in obedience to God. We need to do all the things that God has told us to do. So the reason why I bring that point up is because in our efforts to want to get more people in, because the reason why I want more people to come to church is because I want more people to be affected the way that I was affected. I want more people to get plugged in and to start making better choices for themselves in their life. I want them to learn and to grow spiritually. That's what I want for people. That's my motivation. That, you know, it's not because I want to get more people just filling seats so we could get a bigger building and so that we could get more money coming in. Look, I don't care about the money. I don't care about the building. I care about the people. And, and, you know, that's the whole purpose of doing this challenge and trying to get more people to come in. This is, this is the goal. And understanding that God's the one that built the church. Look, we gear our church services towards saved people. We're not gearing it towards unsaved people. We're not going to throw out all of what we believe about Scripture and, and standards and, and the way things ought to be run in church. And, and the edifying of, of believers in order just to satisfy a bunch of unsaved people. Because, look, we could fill this building. We could move on to another one. We could, we could get a size of a building like the one down the street. All I have to do is change my preaching, tickle the ears, and just make everybody feel good all the time. Don't step on any toes, right, and just talk good all the time. That's what happened. That, look at the biggest mega churches out there. Listen to what they have to say. That's exactly what's going on there. But that's not what it's all about. We want to we want to influence people and help people to do the right thing. And um, it has nothing to do just with the amount of bodies here. But because we want to reach people, we do want people to come in. Right. I mean, that's we, we want people to be able to grow and to learn. So as the Bible said in Luke 14, you know, the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. God wants his house to be filled. And in first Timothy chapter three, look at verse number 15. The Bible says, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So we have scripture here referring to the house of God being the church, the church of the living God. We're in the house of God when we're congregated together here. You know, this is God's building that he's built, this church. And we want to compel people to come be part of this church. Be part of God's building. Be part of the pillar and ground of the truth. And see, that's what the church is supposed to be about, the pillar and ground of the truth. It's about preaching the truth, learning about the truth. Turn, if you would please, to 1 John chapter number 1. So in our challenge, of course, a challenge, the goal is just going to be to invite people to come to church that have never been to our church before. Obviously, talk to people who have been to our church before and invite them to come in too. But the way that the, 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 the rules, if it will, right, the, the rules of our challenge, because we give prizes out for completing challenges. Everybody who brings in visitors to church will receive a small prize, and the person who brings in the most people during the month of May 
is going to get the grand prize. All right. So that's the way that this that this is going to work. But I'm, I care a lot more about explaining why this is important. All right. This is this isn't about just just filling bodies. It really isn't. Primarily, I think the, the best way to, and, and, and this is why I say the, the preaching the gospel is the most important, because I don't want you going for the month of May and saying, well, instead of preaching the gospel, I'm just going to do a whole bunch of door hangers and I could just spread a lot more information just trying to get people to show up to church. We're not forsaking preaching the gospel at all in order to meet this challenge. That's, you're missing the point completely if that's what you're planning on doing right we're not that the, the goal is more to follow through with people and to follow up with people and to keep in contact with people that you already meet that you're preaching the gospel to and to, and to continue to to make an effort to say hey especially when someone gets saved when someone puts their faith in, in jesus christ you know encourage them Hey, why don't you come to church? Because then you can do two things. You can get them, try to get them plugged in church and get them baptized. Both are really important. That's right. and, and, you know, this is coming off the coattails of, of April where we're trying to get people baptized already, which, which essentially is getting them in here. Now, obviously, we can do a baptism anywhere where there's enough water to do a baptism. It doesn't have to be here. This is just a real convenient place to do it. So... Um, I just want to make sure I cannot emphasize that point enough. You're in 1 John chapter number 1. One of the important reasons of coming to church is the fellowship. The fellowship that you receive. Every believer needs to have fellowship with other like-minded believers. It's an encouragement. It's strengthening you need to be able to come in and be around other people. Look at 1 John chapter 1, verse number 3. The Bible reads, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. He's saying, we want you. What he's saying is, look, we have... All the things that we have seen and heard, we're saying them unto you. We're declaring these unto you so that you can have fellowship with us. We want you to have fellowship with us, so we're giving you the truth. We're letting you know all about Christ. We're letting you know all these great truths. We want you to be in fellowship with us. He says, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. That's who our fellowship is with. And we're writing these things unto you that your joy may be full. Why? Because if you're in fellowship with God, if you're in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to have joy. When you walk in the Spirit, one of the fruits of the Spirit is, is joy. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. These are all fruits of the Spirit. So when you're walking in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit is going to consist of, of basically doing right, doing good, uh, communing with the Lord, being in fellowship with God. But through your walk with God, walking in the Spirit, you will get joy. Um, he says he wants your joy to be full. Verse number five, this then is the message that we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Now, I want to just make this point real clear. Being in good fellowship with the Lord is not the same as being saved. You put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're born again. You are a child of God the moment that you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. It's that simple. The Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. But you know what? Being um, in fellowship with the Lord, that is work. So your salvation is not of works. Becoming a child, being born again, being spiritually born into the God's family... That requires no work on your part. Jesus did all the work for you. Amen. You become a child. But just because you're born in a family doesn't automatically make you a good child. There are good children and there are bad children. Now, the children are children. And the father is going to love 
all of his children, good and bad. He loves them and they have a place with him. They have an inheritance that's been bought and paid for that had nothing to do with their works. But if you want to have good fellowship with your heavenly father, that's going to require work on your end to be listening to him, listening to what he has to say and being obedient unto him. That's how you have good fellowship. If my kids want to have a great relationship with me as their father, they're going to need to listen to me and be obedient unto me. And you know what? Things are going to go really, really well for them. But if they dis decide not to be in obedience and not to listen to what I have to say, well, it's not going to go so well for them. We're not going to have good fellowship together because I'm always going to be angry with them. I'm always going to have to be disciplining them, punishing them because they don't listen. It's the same way with God. Okay, when you're his child, he, look, I love my children. It doesn't matter if, you know, if they are bad children, I'm still going to love them, which is why I'm going to correct them, which is why I'm going to discipline them. But they're not going to be kicked out of my family. They're still my children. And it's the same way with God. We need to be, you know, if we want to be in good fellowship with him, that's why it says if we walk in the light, as he, or in verse number six, if we say that we have fellowship, oh yeah, I know God, you know, you know, I've got a great relationship with God. I have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness. The Bible says we lie and do not the truth. So if you're off just living a sinful lifestyle, doing whatever, and you're a liar. You don't know God. You don't, you don't have this great fellowship with God. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Turn, if you would, please, to Hebrews chapter number 10. So when you come to church, when you get into God's house, one thing, you're, you're showing up to God's house, right? As a child of God, you're deciding, you know what, I want to be in good fellowship with the Father. And you'll be in fellowship with other like-minded believers when you're choosing to do what's right. The Bible teaches us all the way back in Leviticus 19, that we should not suffer sin on another believer. In Luke 19, or excuse me, Leviticus 19, verse 17, the Bible reads, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. So one of the ways that you love your neighbor, because they're saying you're not supposed to hate your neighbor. You're supposed to, or, uh, you're thy brother, right? That's what the, the Bible says specifically. It says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. But you need to rebuke him and not suffer sin upon him. So oftentimes when people get rebuked, they feel like they're being attacked and that the person who's rebuking them hates them, doesn't like them, you know, because why are you saying it? you're making me feel bad, right? But if you're the person getting rebuked, you need to remember, you know, obviously consider the situation, but try not to let your emotions cloud your judgment. Because the Bible teaches us that actually if you love somebody, you're going to want to help them to be corrected in an area where they need correction. If, if, they're, if someone just getting, you know, a brother is just getting off into sin, well, if you love that person... You're going to try to tell them, hey, don't go that way. I mean, just think about, not even spiritually for a second, just think about your own family. If you've got a flesh and blood brother or sister, right, and you keep in contact with your sibling and you notice they're starting to make some bad choices in their life. If you love that person, you're going to try to warn them and tell them, hey, don't, don't go that way. You know, you notice they're starting to go out to the bars regularly. They're starting to go out and, and hang out with these, these different types of people, get involved in, in things they shouldn't get involved in, whatever it is. 
if you love that person, you're going to try to to say something to, to get them to change their behavior. Why? Because you should know that the result of that behavior is only going to lead to destruction. Because that's, that's all it ever does. The, the, the wages of sin is death. And the outcome of sin is never a good thing. So when you see someone going down a bad path, if you love that person, you're going to try to warn them. You're going to try to help them. You're going to, to tell them not to go that way. But if you hate them, you're just going to ignore it. And look, you know what, that, you know what, what happens as a result? It's going to lead to some uncomfortable times. Because it's not pleasant to face sin head on in somebody's life. It, it doesn't make you just feel great to go out and, and bring up something that might be a sensitive issue. But you know what? Loving someone, oftentimes the, the amount that you love someone is tested or proved by what you're willing to do and what you're willing to say to someone, even if it does hurt feelings. And people whose heart is right will recognize that and will be able to say, okay, I see this person actually cares about me. Even if it does bother you at the moment, you know, you need to be able to look back and take a step back and say, okay, I needed to hear that. Look, I've been rebuked in the past. My wife's been rebuked in the past. We've all probably been rebuked in the past. But, you know, I love the people that care enough about me to even potentially jeopardize a friendship or jeopardize a relationship because they know this is going to be upsetting. But if they really care about you, they're going to bring it up anyways and just say, okay, look, this is important. You need to hear this. Now, we're not talking about nitpicking every little last thing that somebody does wrong. Okay, there's a big difference between getting the microscope out and looking at a sinner and saying, okay, well, you're wrong here, here, here. Look, it's not what we're talking about. But we're talking about, you know, some bigger decisions, bigger events bigger sins that, look, you need to just make sure that this person's not getting off um, on the wrong path. Because we're all going to have our own faults. And you just don't want to get so focused on everyone else's faults, right, that you, you become um, too judgmental of a, of, a, of a person. You know, obviously we ought to have judgment and proper judgment. And I'm not saying that judging is wrong. But getting too focused on everyone else's faults is... Uh, Usually, usually people who get that far off into, into looking at everybody else's sins usually has their own um, much bigger problems to worry about anyways. So in Hebrews 10, the reason why I'm bringing this up about not suffering um, your you know, sin upon your neighbor, upon your brother, when someone gets saved, that's your brother or sister in Christ. And what we're going to read here in Hebrews chapter 10 is that Essentially, it is a sin to not be in church. And I think this ought to be emphasized to people because a lot of people these days don't see much of a reason or a value in going to church. Why should I go to church? What's the big deal? And, and this, this notion and this mindset of, well, I can just have church anywhere. I could just be at home and I just have church at home and I just pray to God and that's all I need and I don't need to go to church or I can just, you know, do whatever and that's church or I could talk to my friends about Jesus and that's church. No, it's not church. Yes, the Bible says we're two or three to gather together in my name. There am I in the midst. But he doesn't say and that's church. Jesus Christ can be in many places. I think Jesus Christ is with us when we go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't mean that that's church. You can have great conversations with people. You could be gathered together in your house. You could be eating a meal. You could be talking about the things of God. And Jesus Christ can be right there with you, but that doesn't make it church. Because church, by definition, is a congregation of believers. And within the church that God has instituted, God has also ordained there to be different positions of leadership. There's, there's deacons, there's bishops. You know, these are people that, that the Bible talks about has qualifications that need to be met in order for somebody to be running the church. There's different members within a church. And we're supposed to all be working together. And we're, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. But let's just read Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 23. The Bible says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. 
And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So he's saying we need to hold fast our profession of faith without wavering. Now, going back to my own personal example of my life, I told you I got saved when I was 20 years old. But I didn't get into church until much later. I was like 27 years old. So I got the seven years of just wandering in the wilderness, so to speak. And there are many times my profession of faith was very weak and wavering. There are people, I had great opportunities to try to give the gospel to someone, and I didn't. Why? Because I was embarrassed to even tell anyone else that I was a believer because of the life that I was living. I was ashamed of my own life, and I blew opportunities because my faith was out there wavering and be like, how is this person even going to believe me? I had a friend who was getting involved in Mormonism. And I tried to like tell him a little bit, but who was I? I had a terrible testimony to try to convince somebody. Oh, no, that's because the draw for him was, hey, they seem to be pretty clean. They're family oriented, right? They, they, they don't drink. They don't smoke. They don't do all these things. That's what he was looking for. To him, that was an, an outward sign of something that was just good, right? It presented this, this good picture. But then you're going to have me telling him, no, no, that's false. Actually, this is what's true. And my testimony is horrible. Yeah. I was in that group that he was looking to get away from. Church is important for that reason. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. When we come together, you're provoking one another. You're considering. That's why we have our prayer list. What? We're considering other people. We're thinking about other people. We're thinking about other people's needs and their problems. And we're trying, you know, you should be getting to know everybody in church, knowing more about them, becoming, you know, friends with them. They're your family. People here are your family. Everybody who's saved is a child of God, is your brother or sister in Christ. We should be looking out for each other. We should be encouraging one another, provoking unto love and to good works, doing what's right. Help give that encouragement. Why? Because the world's out there is going to be telling you to do all the wrong things. You need to be encouraged to do the right things. But then in verse 25, the Bible says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. He's saying there's some people out there, their manner is just to forsake the assembling. The assembling is the congregation. That's the church. When we decide to assemble together, we have three different assembly times. We assemble Sunday morning at 1030. We ass assemble Sunday afternoon at four o'clock and we assemble on Wednesday nights at seven. Those are our assembling. And when people decide, no, nope, I'm just going to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It says, as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. People who forsake the assembling are sinning willfully. They're choosing and saying, you know what? No, I don't want to go to church. I'm not going to do this. We should not be forsaking the assembling. We need to be get together. And that's why the Bible says, that it's, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day is that? The day of Christ. As you see the day approaching, as the times get worse and worse, we need the assembling of ourselves together more and more. We need to be getting in church more. It is that important according to Scripture. Turn to Ephesians chapter number 4. Now, many of you already know these things, but the reason why I'm bringing it up now is so that you can help show other, make note of these references. When you talk to someone, especially a new believer, explain, look, church is really important. People, especially in America these days, are real flippant about church. It's just not a big deal at all. Not every country is like that. Some people, man, they, you know, some countries, they get really zealous about going to church, as they should. Right. Unfortunately, these days, people just don't care that much. They've got excuses. They've got so many other things going on. Oh, well, I can't make it to church because, you know, 
well, football's starting and the game's on, or I've got, you know, I've got whatever to do and not willing to make any changes or schedule, any sacrifice, anything to come to church. Because why? Because they don't see it as being very important. That's why I like to show people Hebrews 10 because it says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. He's saying that's not something you should do. So if you're forsaking it, if you're not going to church, the Bible says that's something you should not do. You should be in church. The Bible also says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11, this is another place that I like to turn to to show people why is church important? Why should I even bother going to church? Verse number 11, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And this is talking about gifts and different roles that, that God has distributed to believers. That people have different functions. There's different jobs that have been given. And he lists off some of them here. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And what is their purpose? Verse number 12, for the perfecting of the saints is one of them. Who are the saints? Anyone who's sanctified through Jesus Christ. The short term is saint. A saint, don't, don't be confused with what the Catholic Church teaches as a saint. The, the word saint literally means you're sanctified. If you've been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, you are sanctified. If your faith is in Jesus Christ, you are sanctified through his blood unto God. You are set apart because you're saved. You don't have to do a certain amount of works to achieve sainthood. You're a saint just by putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because you've been sanctified. So the perfecting of the saints, that's one of the reasons that God has given these men these jobs. To help people to grow, the perfecting. Hey, help you understand things a little bit better. It makes perfect sense. Someone who is very ignorant of God's word, ignorant of the Bible, ignorant of a lot of things, it doesn't mean they're stupid, they're just ignorant, they don't know better. And when people put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're a newborn babe. They need to learn, they need to grow. So it makes sense that someone who has already met qualifications of being someone who's not a beginner, not a novice, someone who knows the scripture, knows the Bible, who's able to rule well, is able to do all these things, is someone that should be able to help and teach and perfect the, the upbringing spiritually of people, you know, of, of, anyone, of, of believers, of the saints. So their job, according to the Bible, is for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, right? So it's not just about um, perfecting the saints, but doing other work, reaching more people, ministering unto people, ministering unto those in need, min preaching the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is a great ministry, uh, for the edifying of the body of Christ. It's all for the good of the body, which is the church. Verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth, so from here forward, that we be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. There's a lot of people out there that are able to use the Bible in cunningness and craftiness to deceive people who don't know the Bible. People who are carried about with every wind of doctrine. Because there's, if, if you don't know God's word, it's a lot easier for someone who's already been planning and... and um, you know, they, they have their, their slight, you know, it says the slight of men, their craftiness. They lie in wait to deceive, to trick people. Mm -hmm. They've got it all planned out. Well, see, look, the Bible says this here and this here and this here and this here. And, and then just teach something that's totally false because the person that they're talking to doesn't know the Bible. At all. They, have, they don't know. There's not another verse. So like when a, when a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon comes and, and tries to teach me their false doctrine and their false God, because it is a false God. They believe in the Son of God, but not that Jesus was, was, was deity. That's a different Jesus. When, if you don't believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, you have a different Jesus. 
And when they go and try to teach things or try to teach you that salvation is of works and they try to, to bring up a verse and, and especially out of context and use these verses to try to show you, oh no, you need to do good works in order to go to heaven. If I didn't have hundreds of other verses just going off of my mind going, no, 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 this doesn't mad up because of this and this and this and this and this and this, then it's a lot easier to be deceived. And this is why every believer needs to grow and learn and receive good teaching from people that God has ordained to help so that you're no longer going to be children. You're no longer going to be tossed to and fro and then, oh, this sounds good. Okay, I'll go with that for a while. Oh, no, wait, that's not right. And then get tossed to the next thing and tossed to the next thing. We don't want to be tossed to and fro. We won't be carried about with every wind of doctrine. We want to get settled and grounded just in the truth and what the Bible actually says. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the special working and the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, I'm not saying that you can't learn or understand the truth unless you come to our church. So don't take that the wrong way. I believe, and I actually stress, that everybody reads the Bible for themselves because ultimately you are the one who is responsible to God for how you live, for the decisions you make, for what you believe. So responsibility starts with the individual. You need to read the Bible for yourself and judge and weigh whether what you're hearing is right. However, that doesn't minimize the importance of church either. As much as you should be doing this on your own, it's hard to do it on your own, especially when you're not fellowshipping with other people and receiving edification, receiving encouragement, and be just being around other people that believe the same thing. For those seven years that I was saved but not in church, Every time I picked up my Bible, I practically had to dust it off, all right, because I was not doing it that often. Now, I knew I should be doing it, but everybody that I was hanging out with wasn't reading their Bible, if they even had one. It wasn't coming up in conversation. I wasn't going to church, so how often am I really even thinking about it? Not very much. But guess what happens when you get into church? Well, now you're at least thinking about, well, I'm going to church on Sunday. That's, that's part of my schedule. That's something that I'm going to do. So it's at least to that point, it's in my mind. Then we come to church and we're going through different passages and we're actually reading the Bible. And we're, go, we're turning different places. Hopefully, the Word of God is speaking to your heart that's right. to where you might want to go home and be like, you know, I want to read a little bit more about that. I want to study this out some more. I want to check this out because that's pretty interesting. And then you're around other people who are doing the same thing, you know, we're having challenges, you know, read your Bible, do this and that, and is meant to encourage you and to help you. Church is, there's, there's many reasons why church is important. I'm just scratching the surface, but for this challenge, I want you to really think about why is church important to you, and especially why is this church important to you? If you want people to come and visit church, First of all, you have to explain to them why is church important. And I went over a lot of that. Why is it important? It's going to help them. It helps you. It helps me being in church. Even though I'm a pastor, it helps me tremendously being here. Yes, I have a job of teaching and preaching, but I'm a sinner just like you. Yeah. If I wasn't here, if I was just off, I would devolve back into my old self. I need this just as much as you do. And I need the encouragement. I need the edification just as much as anybody else does. We all need to, to be around a group of believers. And it's to help grow. So I want you to think about why is church important to you? What do you like about this church? Why, should, why would you tell someone else to go to this church as opposed to any other church? You know, and, and again, it's not because, oh, we've got the, the corner on the truth. No. 
The truth is right here. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of people out there that are just preaching the whole word of God. It's just there seems to be a lack of that. So when I think about our church and some of the things that I love about our church, I love the fact that we go soul winning where we go out and preach the gospel to people. That's right. Now there's other churches that do the same thing, but this is one of the things I love about our church is that it's emphasized. We really want people to go out and make a difference in other people's lives and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ unto them. That's an important thing in our church. Now, not everybody that you talk to that's going to be important to them because usually you have to grow a little bit before that becomes important to you. As a newborn babe, I'm thinking, I don't know about all that, right? But you at least know you want to grow, you want to, you want to do more. So soul winning is important to me. It may not be important to everybody. I like the hard preaching. That's one of the things that really helped me out was the, you know, you don't have to read between the lines when we're going through the Bible of what's right and what's wrong, but just the instant application of like, oh man, this is what the Bible says and I am wrong and I need to change. Amen. That's one of the things that I like. I like that we use the right Bible. We're King James only. I like that there's lots of Bible being read and used in church. I like that there's a lot of great people here. I mean, this, this church is filled of just really good people. I love everybody in our church. You guys are awesome. And that means a lot to me too. I mean, people who you can depend on, people who are there for you, people who love you and care for you. This isn't just, uh, and, I, and, and you know, to the best of my ability, I don't ever want our church just, just becoming different factions and cliques. We should always, care. you know, obviously there's going to be some people you gravitate, gravitate more to and you're going to be more friends with and stuff. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But this isn't going to be some, some clicky church. And I want everybody that comes in to feel welcome and, and, and feel that, that this is a loving church and we care about people here and we care about everyone that comes through our doors. So um, that's one of the things that I like. And I feel like, like people do a good job of that here too. I also like that it's family integrated. I love having the kids in service. You know, and that's important to some people too. You know, some people don't want to be separated from their children. I don't want to be, I never wanted to have my children separated from me. I wouldn't allow for that. And that's one of the things I like about this church. So think for yourself, why do you, you know, what, what are you excited about in our church? What is it that you like? And then express that to other people. That's why I'm bringing this all up. Because if I'm going to talk to someone about, hey, why should you go to our church? You know, one of the things, and, and it's harder for me being the pastor to explain to someone why I love their church because I don't want to just sound like some salesman right. right at the door but you're not the pastor so you can just say whatever it is that you love about church and explain hey this is these are some of the things that we do here why don't you come and check it out and 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 see what you think and I've been in a bunch of different churches this isn't like every other church we're not exactly the same there's a lot of different churches out there and we need to convince people that, you know, maybe you've been to one or two churches or something, but you can't just broad brush, be like, oh, well, I've been in church before. I don't, you know, no thanks. Well, why don't you come and try out our church and just see if there's, if there's anything for you here and something different, especially, again, especially when people get saved. Our testimonies are great, but I encourage you to use the word of God because that's what's going to have the most authority anyways. That is the authority. Show them Hebrews 10. Show them Ephesians chapter 4. If church wasn't important, then why did God dedicate so much time in Scripture to talking about different roles and responsibilities and the body being fitly joined together and, and, and all these different things? The Bible says that Jesus Christ died for the church. Yeah. You can show them Ephesians chapter 4. It's another great place that talks about um, Christ and the church. It talks about husbands and wives, but it talks, and then it relates that to, to Christ and the church. So, I mean, if God's dedicating so much time to church, maybe you should dedicate a little bit of time That's to right. church. Right. So that's the, um, the, the plan or the goal, the challenge for the month of May, is to try to reach people and express and show them the importance of church. Follow up with them, try to get them in, 
for their benefit, to help them to grow, to help them to become discipled. And again, it's still part of the, the Great Commission. The Great Commission is going out, not just preaching the gospel, but baptizing and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And we can get all those things done. We go out to preach the gospel, but we need to bring them in for them to be discipled. This is our discipleship class. We do it three times a week. All right, so be sure to be remembering this now. And, and you know what? You don't have to start next week. We start today. You go out soul winning, you know, preaching the gospel, tell people about church. Kill two birds with one stone. We're still in April. Get someone to come in, get baptized, and then, you know, keep coming to church. That's, uh, and, and you'll be able to, to hit both goals. All right, let's bow our heads, have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, the great wisdom and truth that we can find in your words. Lord, I thank you for establishing this institution of the church and that you've, you've given us so much information about it, Lord. It truly has helped change my life getting into church. And I pray that you will please help everyone here to be able to express the importance of church, especially when we go out and either run across people who, have already, who are already saved and they're just not in church now, or people who, um, who just get saved. Lord, help us to express that importance to, to everyone that, that we could come in and that, and that your house could be filled. Lord, we want, we want this house to be filled because that's going to mean there's more people uh, fellowshipping and provoking unto love and the good work so we can do more things to serve you and make a bigger impact in our community, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.